been great. Yeah, honestly, things are uh, busier than ever. It's. I was just thinking about it the other day. You know, when you come to the end of the year and you start thinking about like the things that you did this year and try to <laughs> try to tell yourself that you've uh, accomplished something. Um, yeah, I've been all over the place, so it's it's crazy. I think I toured in six countries this year and had the platinum record. And yeah, it's just it's been it's been a lot. So I'm pretty happy. Things are good. I'm, and now I'm I'm in the studio right now. I just finished building our brand new studio here in in downtown Edmonton. And um, yeah, I'm working on new music all the time. I love it. And is your studio a home studio? Or- no, actually. So I. Yeah, so it's it's not really it's still a private studio, but uh, me and a couple friends, um, my music video director and branding guy, and, and our other buddy that uh, manages all my uh, online ad spends, we uh, we have a little spot. This is actually our fifth iteration of our studio space, but uh, so we have this really great like green screen behind the camera here, green screen studio, photo studio, uh, really cool like lounge for writing and hanging out in and doing little meetings and. So there's my office, which is this studio, and then uh, the other two guys have offices here. So it's it's a great spot, man. We it just feels so good to get my studio out of my house and have somewhere to go where I can concentrate a little harder. I have to change out of my pajamas once in a while, though, so that sucks. Exactly. You know, there's something about an environment, though, isn't there? To like set it up the way you need it for, I don't know, creativity. Just things to start amplifying and firing up. Oh, totally, man. I, you know, the, uh, so many of the, like the, the online studio self-help sort of vlogs and stuff like that, they always talk about vibe. They always talk about ambiance. And so that was a big thing for me going into this space. Like we, you know, built the wood wall and I got some nice carpets and lamps and lights I can change colors. And it just, it feels cool and it's fun for people to come work here. So that's really the goal. Do you usually write in your studio as well, or is it at home you write or on the road? How does Where does your inspiration usually come from? Well, in the winter, it's probably going to be here, to be honest, because it's, you know, I feel like when it hits November, December, all the Canadian musicians head back to their creative caves. So this is mine. Um, but, you know, typically I'll go to Nashville a couple times a year and, and uh, I have a publishing deal. So I write for tons of other artists and tons of different genres. So you know, I've been I've written in like Denmark and London and in China and Dominican Republic, all over the place. So it's been it's always just, you know, I'm settling into something new, but um, I love doing that stuff. You know, I think it's so good and so healthy to uh, reset by trying some things that are uncomfortable. And yeah, it's fun. Like right now, I, I just got last week, I just got told that I have a, a K-pop hold on one of my K-pop pitches that I've done. <laughs> So it's uh it's it's always strange turning off my thirty something suburban country musician brain and turning on my fourteen year old Korean pop singer <laughs> brain. I love it. You know, it's funny though that people don't realize how big K pop really is. It's massive. Oh, dude, it's crazy. Like they're they're playing cities that are four times bigger than Toronto and we've never heard of them before. They're selling arenas, 20,000 people a night, these, some of these bands. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's wild. When you start, you know, peeking behind the curtain of, of that genre, you start to see how small the Canadian music industry is, you know, and we get lost in it because it's my whole world, you know, but when you, when you see that there's these places that are massive, massive cities, half the population of Canada, some of them, and uh, yeah, there's there's a whole other star system out there. Man. And there, I think there's a BT. It's called BTS. Yeah, that's the that's the probably the most probably the most popular in America. Those guys, I'd say. It's super cool. I'm like, I don't even know about you guys, but you have a huge fan base. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, and it's such it's so crazy. They're like businesses. Some of these bands, like there's this one called the J Soul Brothers, a J pop band, and there's like ten people in it, and the band's been going since the '80s. So they you age out and they bring a new member in. So it's like this revolving door, same band, and there's some genius somewhere who owns the whole thing and probably made an ungodly amount of money. Is it hard to make a living if you want to be a an artist today? It is. It's totally hard. It's frustrating. And there's a ton of roadblocks and there's a ton of politics and music. And it's, 
You know what? I the, I think the reason that I'm still at it, besides the fact that I love it, is I, I equate it to golf. You know, like if you go golfing and you hit one good swing, you're a golfer. And it's the same thing with music. If you get one sniff of, of a successful moment, it's so exhilarating and it's so addicting. And uh, and I had that early on in my career when I was playing in a rock band. And and I've been really lucky. You know, I'm, I'm totally one of the lucky ones where lightning struck twice for me. I had a I had a really exciting career in a rock and roll band in the early 2000s. Uh, we were called Tupelo Honey. And, and, you know, we got to tour North America. We played with some amazing bands, got to play in arenas. And, you know, I had top, top 40s and top five songs on much music and all this stuff. And it was, it was so cool. And when that all went away, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself. And luckily for me, the songs that I was writing for my country solo project just kind of took off really quickly and, uh, and put me right back in the race. So it was, it was cool, but yeah, you know, there, there is a, there is a lot of roadblocks for new artists. Like people just don't know where to start. And, uh, I, I know how frustrating that can be get trying to get attention, especially in a world where, radio stations don't program as independently as they used to. So there's less opportunity for people to, to squeak in that door. And in the internet, there's new, you know, something like 5,000 new songs written every day in Nashville. So it's, there's a, it's a lot. You know, it's interesting because we look at the days of Ian Tyson and you think, wow, they must have uh, had it rough, but their tough is different than our tough today you know, that generation. Yes, there is social media and we think that we have this platform that we can amplify messages, but you're right. Things get washed out because the that we only have two seconds of a, an attention span these days. It's the scroll. Yeah, you know, it used to be, and I always, I think this is kind of cool. It's, it's, it's also super frustrating, but uh, it used to be that you would make great music and then you would make fans. And now a lot of the young artists make a bunch of fans and then they make music and and that seems so backwards to me and uh it's hard for me to wrap my brain around because you know in when i was in my young 20s it was like touring you got to tour 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 never stop get on the road get in front of people that's how you expose your music but uh now there's just it's just a different marketing strategy and it's you know like it or hate it it is what it is so it's you know there's no use complaining about it as an artist because even though I do all the time, <laughs> but it's, it's just kind of the game. Now you have to be interesting online. You have to show personality and, and hopefully that funnels them towards your music. And, and then there's, you know, Spotify playlisting and, and all this stuff and hoping to, to catch a Hail Mary once in a while. You know, Dan, I've watched you on social media and I find it very interesting is you've humanized yourself, humanized the brand. It sounds ridiculous to say it like that, but humanizing yourself, you know, in this day and age about being authentic, being true, being real, you know, you grab the phone and you just talk to people. Hey, you know, this is my latest, uh, you know, the contest that you recently had in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I think that I just I just like I think that's what this the, my fit. Well, first of all, my favorite part of being able to do this for a living is is not only, you know, I get to make music and travel the world with my friends, but I like I love meeting people. I love connecting with people and I love when people connect with the music. So you know, I just, I'm a big friend maker. And I think that in the end, a lot of people don't want to just f feel like they're getting pitched an angle. They just want to get some personality. So I try to tell myself that personality's always got to win in the end, if you're an artist. And, and that's the number one way that people are going to really resonate with you because there's a lot of artists that are saying the same things and trying to check the same boxes and posture the same way. And I, you know, I think I'm going to love myself a lot more if I just am totally real with what I'm doing and, and try and put that out there. Is there ever fear uh, that you face? So 2016, you hit that platinum record uh, found, mm -hmm. you know, aiming for that again. That's another battle that people don't understand, right? There's oh, a whole man. new milestone. You nailed it. That's that's something that no it's one ever battle, thinks about. It? It's it's true. It's uh, yeah. it's it's a blessing and a curse when you have something that does really well because you set that high high bar that you're always going to fight to get back to. So, you know, it's happened twice to me in my career so far. Um, the first was in my younger days in the rock band. We we opened for Bon Jovi in two massive arenas, and I was like, this is amazing. But you know, we'd get off stage, and we'd overhear them 
the Bon Jovi guys talking about jumping in a private jet and flying to Brazil that night. And we were getting in a stinky van and going to Cold Lake, Alberta to play for 17 people. <laughs> you know, So it was highs and lows back then. And, and now it's like, you know, I had found that just went platinum in Canada and it's a huge song. And it's just like, it's an, it's a really high benchmark for sales, even for like a major label artist. And I want that exposure again. And I just have to, I think it's, it's almost a matter of numbers and maintaining quality and, and making sure that the train is always moving forward in a big way. And then, uh, you know, sometimes just something sparks off and it just catches fire. So that's, that's, I think with found why it really worked was because it, it was a wedding song, but it wasn't a sappy wedding song. It was just like a, a get drunk and fall in love kind of thing. And uh, that it was self-perpetuated and fan perpetuated. So I, I don't know what to say. I really hope that I can, I can hit that again. <laughs> it's hard though. And, and you know what? It's not for anybody else, but you guys, that's the thing. Most people think it's for the external validation. It's you no, know, those are just benchmarks, little markers to say is, are you on the right path of whatever journey that you are on? Yeah. And you know what it is that's really great about it? It's, it's inspiring to have those little milestones, even though that a lot of fans sometimes don't really care about them. And it's not like something they'll think twice about. But for me, it's nice, you know, in such a grind of an industry, it's nice to stop once in a while and look around to, to the team around me and my friends and be like, look what we did. This is pretty cool. Like we should we should feel proud about this and, and remember this feeling as a, a way to inspire ourselves going forward. So that's what I take away from it. And your latest song, Girl Drinks Beer. Amazing, by the way. Congrats. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, it's a fun it's one. I've so never fun. I never really uh I don't you know, it's it's a party country song. I've still never used a juice harp before in any of my songs, that little boing 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 sound in the beginning. And and that was that was a fun one. This is actually this is actually the first song that I've self produced for my for me. I've produced for other artists a lot, but I, I just never trust myself to do it. But this time, for whatever reason, I decided to take the reins and, and kind of go it on my own. It's easier to do for others than it is for ourselves. Oh, totally. It's just like the contractor. He's ever makes everyone else's houses look beautiful, but his house is uh, in progress for its entirety, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was good. I think I've fallen into a lot more production stuff these days because in, in a writing session, there's typically one person that's the demo person. And I've just kind of stumbled into being the guy that always makes the demos. And my demos started getting really good to the point where people wanted to just pay me to produce these records. And uh, so I was like, you know what, this is a good demo. I'm just going to shine it up and uh, and see what I can do. And I, I got my producer, Jeff Dalziel, to, to mix it for me. He's been my mentor and the guy that has really taught me uh, about how to record music and, and engineer music. And so, uh, I, I still brought him into the fold to help mix it, but, um, yeah, it was, it was really, really fun. I, you know, I'm always learning something and, and I, it's become a bit of an obsession of mine, honestly, like on the way here, I'm, I'm listening to production and mixing tutorials and vlogs and I don't know, it's just, I just put that on. So it's just out there all the time. I, I don't know why I've become, I've slipped into this hole now. Like <laughs> when you started till today has technology changed in how you produce music and create music totally yeah well now there's the technology is so intuitive and the audio plugins are so easy to use and the presets are so good that everybody's a producer now and and that's good and bad it's good because there's low barrier to entry for new artists to create music and put it online and, and i'm all all for that but at the same time i think it's uh it damages the the songwriting appreciation because I think a lot of times people can shine up a song that's not as good as it should be and sell it as something because it sounds cool. And so I like to, when I'm getting into songwriting and getting in production mode, I still go back to what I learned when I was first starting that whatever song you have, you should be able to play it on a piano or on an acoustic guitar and convince people that way. And if you can, then you know you have something that's worth really shining up. Who was your inspiration uh, growing up, and has it changed over time? You know, I don't. I always draw different inspirations all the time. You know, I I feel like when I was growing up, when I started playing guitar, I got really into like grunge music, and I was loving bands like Silverchair and Nirvana and Soundgarden and and things like that. And that was that was my world, and that's 
I think the thing that really drew me to music was the emotion behind it. And I think that's why I got into rock music and why I still love heavy music is, is it's just, it's, it just trips something um, in my subconscious, I think, where it really just makes me feel it. And as I grew into that and realized that there's these feelings were delivered by great songs and timeless songs, I started to make that more my focus, getting into songwriting, and which obviously led me to country music, which is a songwriter's genre. Um, so, you know, lately I feel like I'm, I'm drawing a lot of inspiration from, um, from people that are able to just deliver something honestly. And, you know, even if it's something that's completely out of my scope of what I can or should do, you know, there's artists like Hayes Carl is this great singer songwriter from Oklahoma who's who's not the most well known guy in the world, but I just I love his style, I love his delivery, and I draw a lot of inspiration from that. And uh, he kind of does this like drunken poet thing, and it's just like it's I can't pull it off, but I, I'm inspired by it. But I also love you know growing up, I, I was obsessed with Dave Grohl and Trent Reznor, and and I loved. You know, I loved Willie Nelson and, <laughs> and all these completely unrelated. Yeah, I know. It's just like, yeah, if something makes me feel something in a song, then I'm just in on it. You know, whatever it is, it, it could be Rage Against the Machine. It could be, I don't know, Shakira, <laughs> whatever it is. I, as long as it's it's effective songwriting, then then I'm into it. Is there a process that you always stick by or has it changed and has it evolved over the years so you're out somewhere you see something that inspires you do you have it on your notes on your phone or do you just mentally jot it down and then when you get home apply it somewhere and leave it for a few days to brew that's definitely one of the things that i've always done and i will always do i think it's just trying to keep my ears open to the world around me. And, uh, and that's something that I was taught by um, Sony, Sony songwriters and, and stuff when Tupelo was working with them back in the day, Jeff Dalziel, you know, he would just be like, you know, sit on a train and just eavesdrop on people's conversations. And, and once in a while, somebody will say something really poetic or something that sounds like a song title and, and always keep that, just write it down in your notes or, you know, and sometimes that's a great starting point. Like having a title for a song is, is basically how it always works in Nashville. Somebody sits down and says, I got this title, it's this. And then you figure out what the story is around it and you march towards that direction. But between that and um, melodic things hit me a lot. So I have these little voice notes in my phone that sometimes make absolutely no sense, like half an hour later, but I'll, be listening, you know, I'll go through them sometimes. It'll say like, I don't know, country idea upbeat or something and it'll just be me just going like doo, 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 doo. no idea what it was but once in a while there's a gem in there so i just try and like just keep it rolling because you know it's it's good to have when you go into sessions just to have a pool of things to pull from and uh so i think that's super important but what i've learned is you know i think that it's great when the listening thing there's i have three sisters and and two daughters and there's lots of women in my life and i always I love to hear the way uh, that women speak to each other. There's something more, there's, I don't know. They fra they think and phrase things differently than I do. And uh, it always just turns things in my head a little bit. And so it, I find it inspiring to, to get a bit of a female perspective when, when thinking about lyrics. When you were growing up, did you know that there was greatness within you? And greatness is different to everybody, but obviously there was something in you, a gift. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I did have any recollection that that I could do something in music more than other people could achieve. Um, I knew I liked it a lot. And I knew that people thought I was a good guitar player. And I but like, I knew I had a, a lot of runway to go, though, you know, like, I, I still to this day, like, I can play and be very convincing. But there's always there's always people I run into and I'm like, Oh, my God, how do I be you? And uh, I don't think that'll ever go away. I don't know if that's just like a Canadian humbleness thing. But yeah, like I know I work hard. I know I, I know that that's a huge trait for me. And, and uh, I find that another thing that I get a lot of benefit from is is just being an approachable person and, and trying to be a good listener and, and a good conversationalist. And, and I think that's taken me, honestly, between that and just working hard and collaborating with people, that's taken me farthest in the music industry. I, I don't think that I'm, uh, you know, a phenom like somebody that that has undeniable vocal talent or undeniable songwriting talent, but I know I'm going to be 
the hardest working guy in the room if I can. <laughs> and I know I'm going to try and make people smile. And uh, I think that general attitude definitely drives the bus a little bit. And I think I think I do have a good um, creative take on things and, and a good handle on melodies and things like that. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's more just the hard work that that really pays off in the end. You've seen what the end looks like in terms of the success. But before that, you know, the days that are tough and, you know, let's say the bank account is not doing well and being an artist is expensive. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. So how did you grind through the, the tough days, the early days and say, I'm going to stick this out? Because oftentimes, you know, when things get hard, people leave they walk away mm -hmm. and that's yeah. regret you know i and i remember the time where i almost did you know like tupelo honey was done like the band had kind of wrapped up we didn't we didn't have anyone to tour with there wasn't a lot of venues at the time rock was not in a good spot so we kind of folded the band uh i went back to school and got a business degree and you know i just didn't know what to do when i got out of school i was like should i am i gonna dive in and do this crazy grind all over again and but I just I just knew I wasn't quite done yet. I had to give it at least one more big swing. Um, and I'm glad that I did. But yeah, when when those days are dark, it, it's tough. You know, I think financially is always the big thing um, for me. I, I'm always very lucky because I have uh, a lot of family around me where I live and and my wife is very supportive and she's you know, she's got a great job. But I didn't want to do that to her. I didn't want to be like this cliche guy that's like washed up rock and roll musician I, I just I had to make it work somehow and for me that meant just figuring out a lot of different things that I had dabbled in before in rock and roll like I, I got really into grant writing so I became a grant writer for a while I was good at finding money for for independent projects and and I got really involved in my provincial music association and and just started becoming a little bit more connected with the industry side of things while going to school and having jobs and doing all that. And, and then it became um, just kind of leaning on the people that believed in me a little bit. Like I, I had a, my producer who was a big help and he, he would, he would, you know, do what he could do things as cheap as he could for me and sometimes for free. <laughs> And uh, one of my best friends, Travis, that I mentioned earlier that I share the studio with here, he uh, is a music video director. And so, you know, I was working with other artists trying to get involved as a, a small label and a producer. And so I'd bring him artists and he hadn't really made a music video before. So I kind of got him into doing videos. And and then uh, when it was my turn to release this country stuff, he really dug in and, and leaned in to helped me develop the brand and, and so it was like these little incremental steps started getting me set up for something um and it's funny though when you're when you don't have a lot of money your marketing plan changes and you have to you have to kind of take those incremental wins as big wins until you can afford to take bigger swings and, and so that that's kind of been the, the mentality that i've been taking you know it's it's do these little things and it's just a river of uh, it's a river of nickels, I guess, but it's death by a thousand cuts. It's just tiny little things get you there. And you, all of a sudden you'll look up and, and you can afford to fly a band to Australia for a week. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a game of determination and, and knowing that it's not easy. I think, I think having gone through it with Tupelo honey and, and seeing how much we put into that band and, and we never got paid and, what the grind was and all the little pieces that we had to put together all the time prepared me for the fact that it's hard and that it has to be a long game. And in the modern day and in, in Canada, you, you really have to really expect that you're not going to be a flash in the pan. You have to be great and don't go away. You took business. What made you choose that in school rather than I don't know, furthering in music or writing or in the art? Well, you know, I did take, uh, I got a music diploma when I was, when I was younger, I, I went to, went to Grant McEwen music, uh, at 17, right out of high school. And I uh, got my music diploma and yeah, I met, I met a lot of great people that I still play with today. And, uh, from there I, out of my Grant McEwen music program, I was right into the band and we were touring and got signed by a big agent. And, and so that lasted for, you know, 13 years, pretty much doing that. And then country things started up 
I got my business degree before that, but I think I chose business um, mostly just to have some some skills and understanding in 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 a world that could be applicable to lots of different industries, you know. And I think in the back of my mind, I still had it that it was like this is going to go towards something in music, even if it's not an artist career. Um, just like really gave me some organizational skills and some understanding on on how to properly communicate. Uh, those are my two biggest takeaways. Like I was never a big finance guy or anything like that, but I was, I was a great, great communicator. And so those were my strong classes, business communications and things like that and uh, organization. And, and so that really after school when I fell into being a grant writer, that really helped me out because my proposals were really strong and yeah. So, you know, it's good. And, and my wife at runs, she runs a family business. And so I figured it, it would help me understand her world a little bit and give her support where I could. And yeah, I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. How important is it for an artist to know uh, a little bit of business and a little bit of understanding marketing, understanding, you know, is this a, great for me to sign this record deal or is it not? Oh, I think it's so. We can get caught up by the, the glamour, right? The shiny things. And, and then oh, we man. miss out on something. And we've seen that in many uh, artist stories of they sign up with this record company and at the end of it, they don't own anything. Yeah, there's a lot there's of pros and horror cons stories. to working with a record company. Let's just say that. Yeah, a hundred percent, for sure there is. I think that like there's there's some great record deals, a hundred percent. There's some that that are amazing. It all depends on the artist capabilities. I find, and I think that um, artists are really well served to do their homework on how this industry works because it works like no other industry. Like, you know my wife's got a degree in international business. And every time I talk about the music business, she's like, this is not how the real world works. <laughs> and, and she's a hundred percent, right? Like the way that contracts are structured, the way that royalties are structured, the way that we collect royalties is it's just insane. You, you, to, you know, there's still five years ago, I was still finding out about new ways that I should be getting paid by all these little royalty streams out there. And, and there's no, handbook about this really because it's always changing in music so i i think that artists are really well served to learn about publishing learn about master recording rights learn about what an agent does what a manager manager does what kind of percentages they take um, what a label can offer that that you can't get um, learn about conferences and showcasing and tour managing there's just an endless amount of things to know um, and I was fortunate enough to to kind of do it in the rock and roll 101 kind of way where I was, just grew up as a kid, basically touring and, and having to handle all these things. So finding out the hard way. But uh, it, like I said, like it was the best gift ever for my country career because I was ready to, to hit the ground running when when it was time. How do you know when networking is overdoing it? So in any industry, you know, there's say 100 conferences. You can go to all of them and say, I'm networking. But are you being productive and are you actually creating things and applying what you learn? How did you know, okay, enough networking and now time to work? Oh, it's 100% an art. Like to be able to be an effective networker, a guy, a guy or a girl that works the room, it's that's hard. It's like it's scarier than being in front of 5,000 people to just go up to somebody and be like, so what do you do here? <laughs> you know you know what I mean? But uh, I think it's important. It's definitely, you know, it's something that I'm still putting. I've decided to put more time into this year is, you know, living in Edmonton. There's just not a lot of music industry in Edmonton. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, committing to spending more time just going to take people up for lunch, going to Toronto for a few days and just take some meetings and and just be seen. Like I was at the SoCan Awards earlier this year and I was like, you know, this is really impactful. I'm not receiving an award. I'm not presenting an award, but I'm hanging out with, with interesting people and artists and, and making new friends. And so I think that if, if you're not living in those major hubs, it's good to go there and, and be seen once in a while, just to make sure that you're on the radar. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding, right? So I, I think making great music should be always number one. And, uh, I think, you know, these days with the strength of social media, having a strong brand and having a, a really good grasp of how to communicate it is, is going to really be the move. I'm in Calgary, so we're not far apart. And I heard you're uh, a big Flames fan, so that's exciting. <laughs> you might have heard wrong. 
(laughs) (laughs) You know, we're in Alberta. It's considered the Wild West here. Uh, Big Western culture. We've got the Calgary Stampede. Why isn't country music stronger out here out west compared to when you look at the east i think it is i think that we have the best fans you know like we've our province is set up like we got i don't know what is it four and a half million people here and uh our the two cities are really not that far apart and there's a lot of corporate money here so i think that usually weasels its way into shows and opportunities and things like that. So being in Alberta is pretty good. Southern Ontario is, is the other market that really crushes just because there's so many people there and there's so many universities and there's so, you know, like all there's infrastructure there, but I find that pretty much the Canadian country music industry is, is uh, I would say 80% is made up by Alberta and not, and Ontario. And then BC is in third for sure. So it's it, it. I think it's a good spot. I mean, Canada is always a tough market because we're a massive country, impossible to tour, such huge distances, and uh, a few people. But you know, whenever we tour in the states or something like that, and talk about doing a six-hour drive to the next show, people just look at you like, "Are you insane? Six hours in the car? <laughs> so, like that's nothing." <laughs> we're from Canada. This is nothing. Oh, uh, let me tell you a story about the rock and roll days before I move on to that. There was a time, one of my first tours ever, we started, we were touring with Mariana's Trench and Everclear, and we started a tour in Halifax. And the, the guys and I just drove straight to Halifax without stopping. 65 hours, four drivers. And uh, yeah, that was uh, pretty much the stupidest idea of all time. But we did it, so we can brag about it. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, a little strange. Shouldn't have done that. But yeah, we were 20. They didn't mind drinking chocolate milk and eating pepperoni and sleeping on the floor of a van for a few nights. <laughs> Do you see Alberta becoming the Nashville of Canada? Yeah, I think Calgary is is the hub. You know, I think that some of the best musicians in Canada live in Calgary. Just a couple of really great studios. You know, I remember back 10, 15 years ago, Edmonton was the place and there was not really a whole lot going on in Calgary, but I think it's totally flipped. Calgary is just like just crushing it for music right now. There's so many great artists there. And uh, yeah, I that's that's the place to be, I think, for country. Is there something that you would tell a young artist or somebody that wants to follow your footsteps? What are some things that you've learned along the way that um, have helped you? I think one thing that I was pushed back against as a young, younger artist was uh, collaboration because I was in a band. So I had a band mentality. It's us against the world kind of a thing. But the more I started to collaborate with people and songwrite with people and trust people, let people in, uh, the better everything got. You know, the, the more people that are engaged in your career the easier time you're going to have generating opportunities. And so that was a huge thing that I had to learn about um, that I would definitely pass that information on. And the other thing too, that I think is a great piece of advice that I was told, um, when I was about 20 was, uh, you know, don't look left or right. Don't care what anyone else is doing. Just focus on your stuff because everybody's journey in music is different. So if, you know, somebody gets a win over here, then be happy for them and, and figure out your own path because it's just, it just never repeats itself quite the same for success in the music industry. So I think it's uh, it's hard to instill that because, you know, it's easy to get jealous and to be envious of, of people's success. And just have to remember that it's all, it's, it's all in our own time. What does Nashville have that, you know, we out West don't have that, you know, maybe in 10, 15 years should have, or it would be nice to have here in Alberta? I, I think it just has become, it's just got such a reputation, you know? So song, every songwriter, well, not every songwriter, but a lot of like the, the really driven songwriters, even from Canada, moved to Nashville to work. Um, and it just, it becomes a hub. So there's so much happening. It's the only true music city basically in the world. You know, New York's a music city, but it's got theater and other things. LA has got movies and London's got everything. So, uh, yeah, I find that Nashville, it's, it's driven. It like lives and breathes music every single day. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. People do morning sessions at nine and then they'll do an afternoon session at one or two. And then everybody just the traffic stands still and everyone goes to the bar, goes to Red Door or one of the other bars and they network until seven. 
and that's every single day. So there's just so much industry happening and it's, it's a really vibey kind of a town, you know, it's, it feels very East coast. Like it feels like, you know, Toronto with the brick houses and stuff like that, but all the head offices of the major labels are in these old houses and major publishing companies. So it's not like a big, tall, high rise, fancy thing. It's like just kind of this cool approachable vibe. So yeah, it's just it's just become a bit of a talent magnet. So people go there and and you know, I I love Canada and I've always found my best songs came from from rights with Canadians despite how many times I've written with American writers that are fantastic. But I just, you know, my roots are down here. I I feel like this is a country that I can tour and be effective in. In America, I'd have to be away for too long. I'd have to live in Nashville and and I want to raise my kids in Canada. So uh I'm proud to to make this my my goal and maybe sneak off to Australia a couple times a year to, to sort of build a market there for hopefully Canadian winter. Um, yeah, I think that that's more obtainable for me and more of a match for my life. No, that's amazing. Are you signed with the record label right now? No, no, I'm still doing the indie thing. And I do have a lot of people around me. Like I, I have a, a guy that does my radio promo and I have a booking agent in, in Canada, Europe and Australia. And I have a PR team and, yeah, like people that ha- help me with branding, but I don't have a manager and I don't have a label. And so it's it's uh, it's it's always a blessing and a curse. I have a lot of work to do all the time, but luckily I know what to do so I can handle it. But, you know, th- that's where the, the politics of the industry become a little frustrating because it's it's true that there are a lot of connections entrenched with, you know, radio stations and record labels and award shows and, and things like that, that it's it's hard to get your head above water. But I think it's, you know, it's a trade-off too. You have to remember that. And, and I always try and remember that that those big award shows and things like that, music isn't football. You shouldn't be able to win music. You should be able to just think about it as like a celebration. So I try to keep that as my mantra as I go into those those moments that could be frustrating for an indie artist. You talked about it earlier that radio stations are not like they used to be where they're, you know, help out the indie Mm-hmm. gal or guy what has changed is it the advertising models have changed i think it's that and uh they've become a little bit more centrally programmed so it's it's um there's groups now that program together instead of every single station making their own decisions and and that just comes from chains trying to be more effective with their time i think and i get it it's business right they want to sell ads and they want to sort of cut down on their costs and and it has been tough on i think the radio world because there's a lot of people you know getting fired and stations changing format and 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 that's sad um and i also think it's a little it's a little tricky too because when you have a group programming situation um the independence of a special market um maybe it doesn't have the same voice it might have had, but there, I mean, it's not the case in every station for sure. So it, it, it is trickier because there's, it's, there's more traffic all trying to get to the one or two decision makers now. And, and uh, you know, in Canadian mainstream radio, there's really only room for them to play 15, 16 Canadian artists. And then um, the rest will be filled up with Americans. So they got to maintain their 40% Canadian content. And, and a lot of them do their best to support, their locals and their indies when they can. Um, But there's a lot of programs now where it's, they have these things like future star or whatever these programs are called where uh, a a chain of radio stations will say like, okay, here's our emerging artist for this month. And then that, that artist will get a lot of plays and shoot right up the charts to number 40 or something like that. So, so that's good and bad. It's good that it, it's it gives new artists a shot. Um, but it can be bad because it is only one artist that gets the shot. And sometimes those artists don't stick around. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the nature of a changing industry. You know, radio is a, is a complicated game and, and I've met a lot of great people, uh, in radio and people that I love. And, and, and I just, I like, I can't complain about it because I understand the business and it is what it is. It's just, yeah, it's just tough because, you know, of how I, grew up in this industry it was a little different and and radio stations could independently make a little bit more decisions um so yeah it's it's tricky and frustrating for new artists but there's other ways to get heard and so my strategy now is to just make it undeniable for them i'm going to do as much as i can that support my brand until the point where it's like yeah this guy's doing things he's he deserves a shot with the the national programming chain so that's kind of the attitude i i feel like i need to take no i love it 
Have you heard of NFTs or digital assets or digital collectibles? I've seen a few country artists now switch to that model to apply that in their branding and whatever they're doing. Have you thought about that? Yeah, like I, I don't know too much about it. Yeah, like I find that um, when some people explain the concept to me, I'm, I kind of think it's it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, cause for me, cause for me as a consumer, that just does not appeal to me at all. Like I can have this one special thing and no one can, I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? So it's just, I, I, I just don't know. Maybe I just don't understand the concept fully. So, but I'm, I'm not really, uh, I don't think I'm going to, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be a pioneer in that world. Let's just say that. Five years from now, 10 years from now, what do you hope for yourself and what do you hope for the industry as a whole? Oh man, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm really happy to be playing music with my friends and, and traveling and, and meeting people. And I just hope that that can continue on a bit of a exponential trajectory. So, you know, I'd love to be headlining shows um, in Canada and Australia um, and sort of what I say, like standing on my own two feet a little bit. Like I, typically my favorite shows that I'm on are usually support shows or soft ticket sales. But my goal for this year is to be able to do a headlining tour and, and sort of prove to people that I can put butts in seats. And uh, yeah, I want to continue to do that, continue to develop my songwriting career and my production career. And just uh, it's kind of just honestly stay in the course, but just going bigger. Why are you targeting Australia? Is it, a, is it an emerging market for country? Are they finally adapting to it or have they always been? Yeah, they're kind. You know, it's country music's like football. You can play it in three places. You can play Canada and America and Australia with slightly different rules. So it's a, it's a, it's a market that's similar to Canada because it's it's about the same size population wise, and it's similar because there's massive parts of the country where no one lives. And uh, going down there was really interesting because they are a big country market, not quite as big as Canada. But they have a lot of great artists. And, and for me, um, it just seemed like a good match. Like I found ways to release music there and, and be able to commit to a bit of consistency and, and traveling there. So I think they're embracing me a little bit. Um, so I, I definitely find that I can develop that alongside pushing my primary goal of Canada and have a place to, to go do a tour for a couple of weeks a year and, and can, you know, find some more fans. That's, that's really what it is. And, and America is great for me too. Like I get probably more plays in America than I do in Australia, but um, it's, it's a little easier for me to make bigger noise in Australia. I think they, they think it's cool that I'm from Canada and I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's maybe there's a bit of a novelty effect going down there, but I'm really loving it. Yeah, like by the end of, we played our first festival there. We played over the weekend three times in, in Gold Coast, this place called Groundwater Music Fest. And, you know, the first show was light and the second show was a little bit bigger. And by the third show, the festival promoter said that there's more people in our venue than any other venue in the festival. So I think we really brought the A game and, and yeah, made some waves. So hopefully we can just keep doing that. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for your time today, brother. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Anytime. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.